This episode of The History Guy is brought to you by Magellan TV and its new documentary series, Warrior Women with Lucy Lawless. Prior to the Second World War, the United States military didn't show a lot of interest in using aircraft to evacuate wounded soldiers to rear areas. The idea of air evacuation was little more than theory at the time, but the demands of a global war pressed the need to transform military medicine through the development of air evacuation, and central to that role were the flight nurses, some of the first women service members to serve in combat zones. Their extraordinary role in evacuating more than a million sick and wounded soldiers from the front during the Second World War deserves to be remembered. The flight nurses of the Second World War were part of a tradition that is both remarkable and more common than we often acknowledge, the contribution of women in war. The new Magellan TV documentary series, Warrior Women, presented by TV's Xena, Lucy Lawless, brings to life some of history's most charismatic women warriors through a heady mix of historical sleuthing and provocative reconstruction, narrated by television's most famous warrior woman. If you watch The History Guy, then you know that I am a big fan of Magellan TV, which is a hidden gem and a rising star in the streaming world. It's the highest-rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. Magellan TV really is the best value of all those documentary streaming services out there today, both in price and in quality. And I think what makes it so special is it's all about the drama of real life, things like the, the lives of ancient pharaohs, or the critical battles of the First and Second World Wars, or the lives of a soldier in the American Civil War, or the Norman Conquest, or the battles for the control of the crown of England, in my experience... Magellan TV really has the largest collection of history documentaries anywhere, and History Guy viewers can get a special offer for Magellan TV by using the link try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. That's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy to get a one-month free trial. Start your free trial today, and you can watch Warrior Women with Lucy Lawless and the rest of the Magellan TV history collection. The concept of air evacuation is as old as the concept of powered flight. The 1988 work, The Story of Air Evacuation, published by the World War II Flight Nurses Association, explains that the origin of air evacuation of the sick and wounded by military air transport is rooted in the period when the Wright brothers developed the airplane. They note that the first proposal in the United States for using aircraft to transport wounded was made to the Army Surgeon General in 1910. Obviously, aircraft technology had some way to go, but air medical evacuation was practiced during the Great War. Dr. Aaron Dolev wrote in a 1986 edition of the Journal of the Army Medical Corps that the first British record of a wounded man traveling by air is dated 1917 in the Sinai Desert. The soldier, a trooper in the Camel Corps, had been wounded in the ankle, flown in an airco DH-4, the trip to a hospital that would have taken two and a half to three days on land, took just 45 minutes. Still, Dolev notes, during the First World War, the airplane was used for the evacuation of casualties to a very minor extent. The reason is fairly simple, as the story of air evacuation explains. During World War I, the service-type evac planes were unsatisfactory, as the patient was wedged into the narrow cockpit of the open plane. Still, they argue the potential was demonstrated in 1918 when a Curtis Jenny was modified to carry a patient by modifying the rear cockpit to carry a litter. The plane, however, was not used during the war. The concept developed slowly, if unenthusiastically, in the U.S. Army when it faced a setback in 1921. The Army had ordered a relatively large Curtis Eagle for modification as an air ambulance. On May 28th, the plane, carrying seven people and assigned to the U.S. 1st Provisional Air Brigade, crashed during a lightning storm, killing all aboard. The accident was described at the time as the worst accident in aviation history. Although the extent of the disaster could have been much worse, as two U.S. congressmen were supposed to be on the flight, but had chosen not to make the last leg of the flight due to air sickness. The story of air evacuation notes that the untimely crash played an important part in delaying the development of aerial transportation of patients in the United States. Surprisingly, the event that helped to resurrect the idea in the United States military came from Nazi Germany. The history of air evacuation explains that in the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1938, the Germans transferred Nazi casualties of the Condor Legion in transport planes. These evacuations made an impression on Dr. Richard Mayling, a young American doctor studying in Germany. Returning to the States, he was commissioned in the Army and became the first and only air evacuation officer. The first medical air ambulance squadron of the United States Army Air Force was authorized in November 1941. Shortly thereafter, the nation was at war. 
The U.S. Army got its first experience using air ambulance when Douglas C-47 Sky Trains were used to evacuate men injured during the construction of the Alcan Highway in Alaska. The construction was remote, and air ambulance offered the only timely way to get patients to a hospital. However, there was yet no formal training for air evacuation, and the history of air evacuation notes the medical personnel involved were largely untrained and on a voluntary basis. A shortage of available planes also offered a problem. The history of air evacuation notes the solution. There was a need for transport planes capable of mass evacuation, yet there was an acute shortage of aircraft. Experience demonstrated that regular transport planes using removable litter supports could be successfully used for air evac as well as for transporting material and combat troops to theaters of operation. This is how the AAF came to decide that the troop and cargo airplanes would not only have their primary mission, but the secondary mission of providing air evacuation. Air evacuation was used by the Army and Navy to evacuate thousands of troops fighting in Burma, New Guinea, and Guadalcanal, but there was still no system for training the medical personnel for air evacuation. The Army Air Force was given responsibility for creating a, such a system in 1942. In their 1955 book, Medical Support of the Army Air Forces in World War II, May Link and Hubert Anderson write that in late November 1942, the War Department directed the 349th Air Evacuation Group to train flight surgeons, flight nurses, and enlisted personnel for air evacuation duty aboard troop and cargo carriers, and authorized the new table of organization for the basic unit, the Medical Squadron Air Evacuation Transport. Under this structure, they explain, each flight, headed by a flight surgeon, was to have six flight nurses and six medical technicians. One nurse and one technician making up a flight team. Still, they explain, the early training afforded these units was haphazard. While Britain and France had established versions of flight nurse programs as early as the 1920s, the U.S. military had not seen the need. But that isn't to say that nobody in the United States did. Attorney and pilot Loretta Schimuller had developed the idea after witnessing the results of a tornado in Ohio in 1930. And in 1933, she had formed an organization to train qualified nurses to improve and increase air ambulance service over the country, including making available to the medical profession proper and adequate air nursing facilities, with special attention to proper protection for patient, pilot, and other passengers. Her program, however, had struggled to gain attention from both the Army and the Red Cross. In fact, Lincoln Anderson note, both organizations failed to comprehend the need with the foresight that Schimmler had. For example, they write, as late as June 1940, the acting superintendent of the Army Nurse Corps stated that the present mobilization plan does not contemplate the extensive use of airplane ambulances. For this reason, it is believed that a special corps of nurses with qualifications for such assignment will not be required. That lack of foresight would put the nation behind the eight ball, as the director of the Red Cross Nursing Service admitted in a letter in 1940. No one of our nursing organizations, no leading school of nursing, nor any other professional group has taken up the subject seriously and definitely tried to promote the organization of a group of nurses who understand conditions surrounding patients when they are traveling by air. Nor has the Army, the Navy, or the Red Cross done this. Members of the Army Medical Section found numerous ways to discount the idea, with one arguing that when necessary to transport ill or injured Army personnel, transport or bombing-type airplanes are used. Nurses are not used on these planes. And another stating, nurses are not required to be, nor is it deemed necessary that they be, assigned to the Air Corps for the rendition of nursing services in the air, inasmuch as enlisted men in the medical department are taught first aid. But Schimmler's vision was adopted by its most important advocate, Major General David Norville Walker Grant, the Army Air Surgeon, who established a recruiting and training program for air nurses. In fact, what some describe as the first Army flight nurse made her debut before the first class of Grant's nurses graduated in February 1943. Author Sarah Sundland wrote in 2018. On January 17, 1943, the first intercontinental medical air evacuation flight took place. For the first time, a nurse participated in air evacuation. Lieutenant Elise Ott had not been trained in air evacuation and had never flown in a plane, but she successfully cared for patients on a week-long, 10,000-mile journey from India to Washington, D.C., For this, she received the first air medal to be awarded to a woman. If the U.S. military was behind other nations in realizing the need for flight nurses, it moved ahead of them when, in June 1943, the Army formally established the Army Air Force School of Air Evacuation at Bowman Field, Kentucky, to offer specialized training for its flight nurses under the auspices of the Army Air Transport Command. Link and Anderson note, the School of Air Evacuation was the first of its kind in the world, and its influence was worldwide. 
During 1943, for example, nurses from the Royal Canadian Air Forces attended the school. The Brazilian government, in cooperation with the Brazilian Red Cross, sent a representative to study the school so that one might be instituted in Brazil. Brazil would get some assistance in that endeavor. The U.S. Bureau of Medicine and Surgery notes that two Navy nurses, Dimfa Van Gorp and Stephanie Kozak, graduated from the Army School of Air Evacuation in January 1944, becoming the first trained flight nurses in the Navy. Upon graduation, the Navy sent Van Gorp and Kozak to Brazil to establish an aeromedical evacuation program in the Brazilian Air Force Nurses Corps. The Bureau continues, seeing a need for flight nurses to support operations in the Pacific Theater, the Navy established the School of Air Evacuation Casualties at Naval Air Station Alameda, California in 1944. By then, the risks involved had already been demonstrated. The U.S. Army Medical Department writes that six nurses of Flight A of the 805th Medical Air Evacuation Transport Squadron had spent 15 months in Alaska evacuating the sick and wounded from the Aleutian Islands campaign. Over those 15 months, the six nurses completed 3,500,000 air miles, evacuating 2,518 cases, all without injury or loss of a single patient. But luck ran out on July 27, 1943. One of the air evacuation planes crashed. First Lieutenant Ruth M. Gardner became the first U.S. flight nurse to lose her life in a combat theater of operations. In a December 1944 edition of the radio show Westinghouse Presents Top of the Evening, broadcaster Ted Malone noted the risks and losses faced by flight nurses. On our flight to Iceland, they told us about the big transatlantic plane carrying a nurse and wounded that started for America. It has never been heard of since. It's just vanished. Nearly every time I visit AeroVac headquarters to see old friends, I find empty places at tables because the ship had hit bad weather and plunged into a mountainside. Only a couple of weeks ago, two ships coming into a blinding English fog that it closed in suddenly over the field crashed together, and the crews, nurses and all, were lost. A stark example of the risk came from First Lieutenant Alda Lutz, who died when her plane crashed in France in November 1944. At the time of her death, Lieutenant Lutz was thought to be the most experienced flight nurse in the American military, having flown 196 missions, evacuating more than 3,500 men. Nurses began graduating from the Navy program in January 1945, just in time for some of the bloodiest operations of the Second World War. The Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery notes by the end of March 1945, the Navy had 84 trained flight nurses. Almost all would be used for the next big challenge, perhaps the biggest challenge of them all, Okinawa. The Bureau explains, Okinawa was the largest combat casualty evacuation operation in U.S. military history and marked the first time the U.S. Navy evacuated more casualties by air then by sea. The first flight nurse on Okinawa was Ensign Jane Kendi. The Naval History and Heritage Command notes that her plane had to circle 90 minutes while the U.S. 5th Fleet bombarded the island until it was safe to land. A public affairs officer documenting the historic trip described the bursting shells beneath us like firecrackers on the 4th of July. Kendi later recalled that she was quite apprehensive at that point, but she added, I was never frightened at the time, only later when I had time to think. I was too busy with the patients to be afraid. Kendi's story represents an attitude that seems almost bizarre today. A story about her in the Honolulu Advertiser is headlined, American fighters on Okinawa astounded by the sight of pretty Navy nurse on plane. Before mentioning her role saving lives, the story opines, the first nurse assigned to an evacuation trip from among 48 new Navy flight nurses to be based on Guam, Ensign Kendi may well have been chosen for her morale building and pinup reasons. Her petite figure is topped by a head of curly brown hair, upon which her overseas cap sits jauntily. There's a warm color in her exquisite complexion. Her gray eyes are extended by dark eyebrows, and her red lip smile reveals even white teeth. Only then does the newspaper mention that she was there to evacuate wounded soldiers. Exquisite complexion aside, it was not an easy job. The Navy History and Heritage Command writes that the Naval Air Transport Service typically flew six flights a day from Guam to the combat zone. VRE-1 primarily flew Douglas R-5Ds, capable of carrying 36 wounded. The medical personnel on flights screened the Marines, Army, and Navy casualties in the forward areas and prioritized those in the most need. The work on the 15-plus hour flight proved grueling. Eventually, the Angels of the Airfields helped to evacuate nearly 12,000 troops from Okinawa. Malone described the nurse's role on top of the evening. Many of the fellows on board have never been in planes before and are much more fearful of the flight back than their wounds. Some are in pain and must be quieted. All of them are hungry. All of them want to talk about anything else than the war, and all of them want to show the picture they have of their wives or mothers or sweethearts or children. 
For their efforts, the flight nurses received scant official recognition. The U.S. Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery writes, The story of the brave women of Iwo Jima and Okinawa remains a footnote in most histories of military nursing. They never achieved any medals for their service, let alone much notoriety. Then again, most would say that they were just happy, doing their jobs. As Vincent Jane Kendi remarked about the role of flight nurses in World War II, our rewards were wan smiles, a slow nod of appreciation, a gesture, a word, accolades greater, more heartwarming than any medal. According to the United States Air Force, more than 500 flight nurses served in 31 air evacuation transport squadrons during the Second World War, and in a testament to their skill of the more than 1,176,000 troops that were evacuated by these squadrons, only 46 men died en route. 17 U.S. Army Air Force flight nurses lost their lives during the war. Malone concluded his top of the evening program. The nurses and medics and doctors of the evac unit, dodging bullets and bombs, are flying right up to the front lines to bring the wounded back. The nurses of the American Army are soldiers in every sense of the word. Most of them will live to tell you more stories when it is all over. But some of them gave their lives, saving the boys, fighting for you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.